From the Odyssey by Homer, translated by Robert Fitzgerald. Odysseus is telling his story to the court of King Alcyonus. The Cyclops. In the next land we found were Cyclops, giants, louts, without law to bless them. In ignorance, leaving the fruitage of the earth in mystery to the immortal gods, they neither plow nor sow by hand nor till the ground. Though grain, wild wheat and barley, grows untended, the wine grapes in clusters ripen in the heaven's rains. Cyclops have no mustard and no meeting, no consultation or old tribal ways, but each one dwells in his own mountain cave, dealing out rough justice to wife and child, indifferent to what others do. As we rode on and near to the mainland, at one end of the bay we saw a cavern yawning above the water, screened with laurel, and many rams and goats about the place inside a sheepfold, made from slab of stone earth fast between tall trunks of pine and rugged towering oak trees. A prodigious man slept in this cave alone, and took his flocks to graze a field, remote from all companions, knowing none but savage ways, a brute so huge he seemed no man at all of those who eat good wheaten bread, but he seemed rather a shaggy mountain reared in solitude. We breached there, and I told the crew to stand by and keep watch over the ship. As for myself, I took my twelve best fighters and went ahead. I had a goat skin full of sweet liquor that Euthanes' son Marin had given me, he kept Apollo's holy grove at Ismaris. For kindness we showed him there, and showed his wife and child. He gave me seven shining golden talents perfectly formed, a solid silver wine bowl, and then this liquor. Twelve two-handled jars of brandy, pure and fiery. Not a slave in Marin's household knew this drink, only he, his wife, and the storeroom mistress knew, and they would put one cupful, ruby-colored honey smooth, in twenty more of water, but still the sweet scent hovered like a fume over the wine bowl. No man turned away when cups of this came round. A wineskin full I brought along, and victuals in a bag, for in my bones I knew some towering brute would be upon us soon. All outward power, a wild man, ignorant of civility. We climbed then briskly to the cave, but Cyclops had gone afield to pasture his fat sheep, so we looked around at everything inside. A drying rack that sagged with cheeses, pens crowded with lambs and kids, each in its class, firstlings apart from middlings, and the dew drops or the newborn lambskins penned apart from both and vessels full of whey were brimming there, bowls of earthenware and pails for milking. My men came pressing around me, pleading, Why not take the cheese? Get them stowed, come back, throw open all the pens, and make a run for it. We'll drive the kids and lambs aboard. We say put out again on good salt water. Ah, how sound that was, yet I refused. I wished to see the caveman, what he had to offer. No pretty sight it turned out for my friends. We lit a fire, burnt an offering, and took some cheese to eat, then sat in silence around the embers, waiting. When he came, he had a load of dry boughs on his shoulder to stoke his fire at supper time. He dumped it with a great crash into the hollow cave, and we all scattered fast to the far wall. Then, over the broad cavern floor, he ushered the ewes he meant to milk. He left his rams and his he-goats in the yard outside, and swung high overhead a slab of solid rock too close to the cave. Two dozen four-wheeled wagons with heaving wagon teams could not have stirred the tonnage of that rock from where he had wedged it over the door sill. Next, he took his seat and milked the bleeding ewes, a practice job he made of it, giving each ewe her suckling, thickened his milk, then into his curds and whey, sieved out the curds to drip in withy baskets, and poured the whey 
to stand in bowls cooling until he drank it for his supper. When all these chores were done, he poked the fire, heaping on brushwood. In the glare, he saw us. Strangers, he said, who are you and where from? What brings you here by seaways at fair traffic? Or are you wandering rogues who cast your lives like dice and ravage other folk by sea? We felt a pressure on our hearts in dread of that deep rumble and that mighty man. But all the same, I spoke up in reply. We are from Troy, Achaeans, blown off course by shifting gales on the great South Sea, homeward bound but taking root in ways uncommon, so the will of Zeus would have it. We serve under Agamemnon, son of Atreus. The whole world knows what city he laid waste, what armies he destroyed. It was our luck to come here. Here we stand, beholden for your help, or any gifts you give. As custom is to honor strangers, we would entreat you, great sir, have a care for the gods' courtesy. Zeus will avenge offending guests. He answered this from his brute chest, unmoved. You are a ninny, or else you come from other end of nowhere, telling me, mind the gods? We Cyclops care not a whistle for your thundering Zeus or all the gods in bliss. We have more force by far. I would not let you go for fear of Zeus, you or your friends, unless I had a whim to. Tell me, where was it now you left your ship? Around the point, or down the shore, I wonder? He thought he'd find out, but I saw through this and answered with a ready lie. My ship? Poseidon Lord, who sets the earth to tremble, broke it up on the rocks at your land's end. A wind from the seaward served him, drove us there. We are survivors, these good men and I. Neither reply nor pity came from him, but in one stride he clutched at my companions and caught two in his hands like squirming puppies to beat their brains out, splattering the floor. Then he dismembered them and made his meal, gaping and crunching like a mountain lion, everything, innards, flesh, and marrow bones. We cried aloud, lifting our hands to Zeus, powerless looking on at this, appalled, but Cyclops went on, filling up his belly with man-flesh and great gulps of whey, then lay down like a mast among his sheep. My heart beat high now at the chance of action, and drawing the sharp sword from my hip, I went along his flank to stab him where his midriff holds the liver. I had touched the spot when sudden fear strayed me. If I kill him, we perished there as well for we could never move his ponderous doorway slab aside. So we were left to groan and wait for morning. When the young dawn with fingertips of rose lit up the world, the Cyclops built a fire and milked his handsome ewes, all in due order, putting the sucklings to their mothers. Then his chores being all dispatched, he caught another brace of men to make his breakfast and whisked away his great door slab to let his sheep go through but he behind reset the stone as one would cap a quiver there was a din of whistling as the cyclops rounded his flock to higher ground than stillness and now i pondered how to hurt him worse but if athena granted me what i prayed for here are the means i thought would serve my turn club or staff lay there along the fold an olive tree felled green and left to season for Cyclops' hand, and it was like a mast, a lugger of twenty oars, broad and beam, a deep sea-going craft might carry. So long, so big around, it seemed. Now I chopped out a six-foot section of this pool and set it down before my men, who scraped it. And when they had it smooth, I hewed again to make a stake with a pointed end. I held this in the fire's heart and turned it, toughening it, then hid it well back in the cavern under the dung piles in profusion there. Now came the time to toss for it. Who ventured along with me? Whose hand could bear to thrust and grind that spike in the cyclops' eye when mild sheep had mastered him? As luck would have it, the men I would have chosen won the toss. Four strong men, and I made five as captain. 
At evening came the shepherd with his flock, his woolly flock. The rams as well this time entered the cave by some shepherding whim, or a god's bidding. None were left outside. He hefted his great boulder into place and sat him down to milk the bleeding ewes in proper order, put the lambs to suck, and swiftly ran through all his evening chores. Then he caught two more men and feasted on them. My moment was at hand, and I went forward holding an ivy bowl of my dark drink, looking up, saying, Cyclops, try some wine. Here's liquor to wash down your scrapes of men. Taste it and see the kind of drink we carry under our planks. I meant it for an offering if you would help us home. But you are mad, unbearable, a bloodthirsty monster. After this, will any other traitor come to see you? He seized and drained the bull, and it went down so fiery and smooth he called for more. Give me another, thank ye kindly. Tell me, how are you called? I'll make a gift will please you. Even Cyclopses know the wine grape grows out the grassland and loam in heaven's rain. But here's a bit of nectar and ambrosia. Three bowls I brought him, and he poured them down. I saw the fuddle and flush come over him. Then I sang out in cordial tones, Cyclops, you may ask my honorable name. Remember the gift you promised me, and I shall tell you. My name is Nobody. Mother, father, and friends, everyone calls me nobody. And he said, Nobody's my meat then, after I eat his friends. Others come first. There's a noble gift now. Even as he spoke, he reeled and tumbled backward, his great head lolling to one side, and sleep took him like any creature. Drunk, hiccuping, he dribbled streams of liquor and bits of men. Now by the gods I drove my big hand spike deep into the embers, charring it again, and cheered my men along with battle talk to keep their courage up. No quitting now. The pike of olive green though it had been, reddened and glowed as if about to catch. I drew it from the coals and my four fellows gave me a hand lugging it near the cyclops as more than a natural force nerved them. Straight forward they sprinted, lifted it, and rammed it deep in his crater eye, and leaned onto it as a shipwreck turns a drill in planking, having men below to swing the two-handled strap that spins it in the groove. So with our brand we bore the great eye socket while blood ran out around the red-hot bar. Eyelid and lash were seared, the pierced ball hissed, broiling, and the roots popped. In a smithy one sees the white-hot axe head or an azed plunged and wrung in a cold tub, screeching steam the way they make soft iron hail and hard. Just so that eyeball hissed around the spike. The cyclops bellowed and the rock roared around him, and we fell back in fear. Clawing at his face, he tugged the bloody spike out of his eye, threw it away, and his wild hands went groping. Then he set up a howl for cyclops who lived in caves on the windy peaks nearby. Some heard him, and they came by diver's way to clump around outside and call. What ails you, Polyphemus? Why do you cry so sore in the starry night? Will you not let us sleep? Sure, no man's driving off your flock. No man has tricked you, ruined you. Out of the cave, the mammoth Polythemus roared in answer, Nobody, nobody's tricked me. Nobody ruined me. To this rough shout, they made a sage reply. Ah, well, if nobody's played you a fool there in your lonely bed, we are no use in pain given by great Zeus. Let it be your father, Poseidon Lord, to whom you pray. So saying, they trailed away, and I was filled with laughter to see how, like the charm, the name deceived them. Now Cyclops, wheezing as pain came on him, fumbled to wrench away the great doorstone and squatted in the breach with arms thrown wide for any silly beast or man who bolted 
hoping somehow I might be such a fool, but I kept thinking how to win the game. Death sat there huge. How could we slip away? I drew on all my wits and ran through tactics, reasoning as a man will for dear life, until a trick came, and it pleased me well. The Cyclops rams were handsome, fat, with heavy fleece, a dark violet. Three abreast I tied them silently together, twenty cords of willow from the ogre's beard, then slung a man under each middle one to ride there safely, shielded left and right. When dawn spread out her fingertips of rose, the rams began to stir, moving for pasture, and peals of bleeding echoed around the pens, where dams with udders full called for a milking. Blinded and sick with pain from his head wound, the master stroked each ram, then let it pass. But my men, riding on the pictorial fleece, the giant's blind hands blundering, never found. Last of them all, my ram, the leader, came weighted by wool in me with my meditations. The cyclops patted him and then said, Sweet cousin ram, why lag behind the rest in the night cave? You never linger so but graze before the dawn and go afar to crop sweet grass and take your stately way leading along the streams until at evening you run to be the first one in the fold why now so far behind can you be grieving over your master's eye that carrion rogue and his accursed companions burnt it out when they had conquered all my wits with wine Nobody will not get out alive, I swear. Oh, had you brain and voice to tell me where he may be now, dodging all my fury. Bashed by this hand and bashed on this rock wall, his brain will strew the floor, and I should have rest from the outrage. Nobody worked upon me. He sent us into the open then. Close by, I dropped and rolled clear of the ram's belly, going this way and that to untie the men. With many glances back, we rounded up his fat, stiff-legged sheep to take aboard, and drove them down to where the good ship lay. We saw as we came near our fellow faces shining. Then we saw them turn to grief, tallying up those who had not fled from death. I hushed them, jerking head and eyebrow up, and in a low voice told them, load the herd move fast and put the ship's head toward the breakers they all pitched in at loading then embarked and struck their oars to the sea far out as far off the shore as shouted words would carry i sent back to the advisory oh cyclops would you feast on my companions puny i am in a cave man's hands how do you like the beating that we gave you you damned cannibal eater of guests under your roof Zeus and the gods have paid you. The blind thing in his doubled fury broke a hilltop in his hands and heaved it after us. Out of our black prow it struck and sank whelmed in a spooming geyser, a giant wave that washed the ship's stern foremost back to shore. I got the longest boat hook out and stood fending us off with furious nods to all to put their backs into the racing stroke. Row, row, or perish! So the long oars bent, kicking the foam sternward, making head until we drew away, and twice as far. Now when I cut my hands, I heard the crew in low voices protesting. God sake, Captain, why beat the beast again? Let him alone! That tidal wave he made on the first throw all but beached us! All but stove us in! Give him our bearing with your trumpeting, and he'll get the range and lob a boulder! Aye, he'll smash our timbers and our heads together. I would not heed them in my glorying spirit, but let my anger flare and yelled. Cyclops, if ever mortal man inquire how you were put to shame and blinded, tell him Odysseus, raider of cities, took your eye. Laertes' son, whose home's on Ithaca. At this he gave a mighty sob and rumbled. Now comes the weird upon me spoken of old. A wizard grand and wondrous lived here. Telemus, son of Eurymus. Great length of days he had in wizardly among the Cyclops, 
and these things he foretold for time to come. My great eye lost at Odysseus' hands. Always I had in mind some giant, armed in giant force, would come against me. But this, but you, small, pitiful, and twiggy, you put me down with wine, you blinded me. Come back, Odysseus, and I'll treat you well, praying the god of earthquakes to befriend you. His son I am, for he by his avowal fathered me, and if he will, he may heal me of this black wound. He, and no other of all the happy gods or mortal men. Few words I shouted in reply to him. If I could take your life, I would take your time away and hurl you down to hell. The god of earthquakes could not heal you there. At this he stretched his hands out in his darkness toward the sky of stars and prayed Poseidon. Oh, hear me, Lord Blue Giddler of the Islands, if I am thine indeed and thou art father. Grant that Odysseus, raider of the cities, never see his home. Laertes' son, I mean, who kept his hall on Ithaca. Should destiny intend that he shall see his roof again among his family in his father's land, far be that day, and dark the years between. Let him lose all companions, and return under strange sail to bitter days at home. In these words he prayed, and the god heard him. Now he laid his hands upon a bigger stone, and wheeled around titanic for the cast to let it fly in the black-prowed vessel's track. But it fell short, just aft the steering oar, and whelming seas rose giant above the stone to bear us onward toward the island. There, as we ran in, we saw the squadron waiting, the trim ships drawn up side by side, and all our troubled friends who waited, looking seaward. We beached her, grinding keel in the soft sand and waded in ourselves on the sandy beach then we unloaded all of the cyclops flock to make division share and share alike only my fighters voted that my ram the prize of all should go to me i slew him by the seaside and burnt his long thigh bones to zeus beyond the storm cloud cronus's son who ruled the world but zeus disdained my offering Destruction for my ship he had in store, and death for those who sailed them, my companions. Now all day long, until the sun went down, we made our feast on mutton and sweet wine, till after sunset in the gathering dark we went to sleep above the wash of ripples. When the young dawn, with the fingertips of rose, touched the world, I roused the men, gave orders to man the ships, cast off the mooring lines, and filing in to sit beside the rowlock oarsmen in line, dipped oars in the gray sea. So we moved out, sad in the vast offering, having our precious lives, but not our friends.